Why is this couple smiling? Perhaps they found hope, meaning, and purpose in the book of Revelation. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a lonely man on a distant island received a remarkable vision. Some readers have been frightened by his vision, but many more have found in it the hope, meaning, and purpose they were looking for. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. John Pauline and Dr. Graham Bradford. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Graham. And welcome to Revelation, Hope, Meaning, and Purpose. Graham, we're coming to the center of the center here. If you remember the chiasm that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. and the very center of the center is the three angels' messages, mm -hmm. which is right in the middle of chapter 14. There's three parts to this chapter. Uh, the first part uh, describes the 144,000 uh, in relationship with Jesus. Uh, the middle part of the chapter is these three angels' messages that is the very center of the book. And then the last third of the chapter uh, describes uh, the final end, the second coming of Jesus and uh, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Let's. Uh, have a look first of all at the, the seven part structure once again, where you see right in the center, the final crisis, this is chapters 12 through 14, that's where we are. And I think the key guidepost text for this section is Revelation 12 verse 17. And we'll have a look at that now. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. As we compare this text with chapters 13 and 14, we get a clearer picture of where we are. You see, Revelation 12, 17 is like a nutshell summary that right at the bottom of the uh, rectangle on the left, a nutshell summary of chapter 13, which describes the dragon's war, and then chapter 14, which describes the remnant's response. So you have two sides in this final conflict of Earth's history, and in chapter 14, we're seeing the positive side of that conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, uh, some people may wonder, you know, why bother studying all this? You know, is it important, really? Mm -hmm. But we have to go back to the sermon that Jesus gave on the end of the world, where he spoke of how history would be until he returns back to this earth again. And in this text, let's bring it up here, Matthew chapter 24, he talks about how the gospel will go to the world, a reaction against it. So we'll just read this text of his Olivet Sermon. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the, the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now, John, it's important for people to realize that when we study the subject in Revelation, we're doing what Jesus said ought to be done. Mm -hmm. He said, go back to Daniel understand what this wicked religious power will be doing at the end of time. Mm -hmm. We saw in our first meeting that primarily there's a local application to Jerusalem where the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem and they worshiped their standards. That was idol worship. That was assigned to those early Christians inside the city. But at the end of time, when the gospel goes to the whole world, there'll be a reaction against it. And to a Jew, idol worship was an abomination mm -hmm. and uh, or image same thing idol or image worship and so you say in revelation where do we find image worship mm -hmm. well we, we're studying it right here revelation chapter 13 mm -hmm. and uh, so when we look at this subject we're saying that we are doing what jesus said we ought, we ought to do he said to his followers understand, go back to Daniel, which really means we now follow it through to Revelation to see how it mm -hmm. unfolds at the end of time. Mm. So uh, what we have here then in chapter 13 is an end time union of political and religious authority mm -hmm. uh, that is combined to uh, force people to worship in a way that is contrary to God. Right. Uh, we found uh, that a similar type of union existed in the Middle Ages and then uh, the prophecy forecast a period of time in which uh, church and state would not be unified, in which there would be relative religious liberty. That's right. Uh, but at the end of time, we need to watch for this, that uh, oppression, 
uh, especially religious oppression, uh, will rise again uh, increasingly as we approach the end of time. When image worship is yeah. enforced, which is an abomination in the eyes of God, mm. really. So that's a summary then. We've, we've kind of gone over chapters 12 and 13 and 14 in the big picture. Mm -hmm. But let's go to chapter 14 itself because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a much more positive uh, image here. Mm -hmm. In verses 1 through 5, uh, we see the following. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. Follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as firstfruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Well, there's a number of things we could talk about in this passage, but uh, Graham, I want to focus first on the idea of 144,000. It says here that these people are the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion uh, with uh, the mark of God upon their foreheads. Mm -hmm. And this is very significant because the trigger passage here was 1217. There it talks about a remnant or remainder. Here it talks about 144,000. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the root text of the 144,000 on Mount Zion, it is Joel 232 in the Older Testament. And that root text says the following, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. That word survivors is the same word uh, in the Hebrew form as we have in 1217, remnant or remainder. Uh, these remnant in Joel 2.32 stands on Mount Zion and has the name of God on their foreheads, just as this 144,000 in chapter 14. So John is elaborating on 1217. This is God's side of the final crisis. Sure. And these people are special companions of Christ. Mm. Yeah, people who've been through similar experiences get very close. There's a bonding with Jesus because their experience has followed His in many respects. And they're virgins. This is a concept not defiled with false religion because we're talking about religion is associated with women. Mm -hmm. And these are people who has, they have no guile, no false, falsehood on their lips. And um, these people are gathered to Mount Zion. And it's very insignificant here that we have two gatherings, one to Mount Zion with Jesus. And the three angels' messages we're about to look at are a connecting link here because there's another gathering to Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And this is gathered by three unclean spirits like frogs. Mm -hmm. And so there's two gatherings and people, mm -hmm. the world will be drawn in two directions at the end of time. One by the Holy Spirit, God's message going to the world. Another by unclean spirits drawing another direction. Yeah. And Revelation 14 verse 12 now has something very significant to say about this too. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. All right. So as we... As we see uh, in this chapter 14, we see characteristics of the people of God at the end of time. Uh, we've seen a lot in Revelation how it goes to great lengths to identify ways in which people work against God, often without themselves uh, even intending to or realizing it. But here we see the more positive side. Mm -hmm. At the end of time, God will have a faithful people. He'll have a people who are focused upon Him. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of time, these people will have a number of characteristics that we can recognize recognize. Uh, people are probably wondering, you know, 666 and Mark of the Beast and, and, and Trinities, both true and false. How are we ever going to work our way through all of this? Mm -hmm. And the reality is the safest place to be approaching that end of time is to be solidly grounded in God's Word. Sure. Because God's Word does point out the characteristics, the qualities of those who will be faithful to Him at the end of time. In chapter 14, verse 12, uh, these uh, particularly focuses on the character, uh, on the relationship with Jesus uh, that these saints 
or this 144,000 will have. Mm -hmm. So I think focusing on our relationship with Jesus, focusing on spending time with Him as mm -hmm. we go through the daily activities of life, this is the most important thing that we could be doing as we approach the end. Well said. When we return from a break, uh, we will come to the center of the center of the book of Revelation, that very part which has its most crucial message. Welcome back. We've come to the center of the center of the book of Revelation, what many call the three angels messages. Uh, the story here portrays three angels flying up in the zenith, the very highest point in the sky, and they are giving God's last message to the world. So understanding something about this message should be very important to us as we approach uh, the end of the world. We find the first angel's message, and uh, perhaps the most important one, is in Revelation 14 and verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So there's the eternal gospel going to the world. This is the final proclamation of that gospel. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. As you remember from our earlier studies, uh, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book, and that means very often things, the story may say one thing, but when we understand the symbols, uh, we see an expansion of the story or a referral to something a little bit different. In this case, angels are frequently in the book of Revelation associated with the people of God and their work on earth. For example, uh, the uh, seven churches, each of them have angels to which Jesus speaks. And I think most scholars would agree these are probably the pastors or the local leaders of the church. So this three angels' messages is another way of describing the final work of God's faithful people on this earth as they approach the end. It's very interesting too, John, that when John the Baptist, his work was prophesied, the statement was, behold, I send my angel or messenger, really. Mm -hmm. It means yeah. a messenger. Yeah. So the same word was used to describe John the Baptist because he had a message from God at that time of history. Mm -hmm. And God does work through people and movements. He worked through Abraham, his family. He worked through the nation of Israel. He's worked through different religious movements of the past. So God, when he does his work on earth, works through people. And we're talking here of God's final message to the world. This is the last call uh, that God is sending to the world. And the first one is a beautiful invitation. Jesus said the gospel will go to the world, and here it is actually happening. And Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, which we're going to bring up on the screen now, also talks about this. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. And so here in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, we're saying that this is about the finishing up of the gospel work. This is the mystery of God, how God can take a person's life and bring the gospel to them and accept them and also revamp their life through a new birth experience. Jesus said the gospel will go to the world. And here we have in Revelation chapter 14, it is going to every nation, kindred, tongue and people as Jesus said it would. Mm -hmm. So it's a complete universal coverage mm -hmm. is what this is all about. Yeah. Now, if you happen to have a Bible handy and you have it open to Revelation 14, uh, this is a very good time to just look at verse 7 because verse 7 has the core of this final proclamation of the gospel in the context uh, of the end of time. Now, the first element in this uh, message is to fear God. So there's four elements. The first, fear God. And uh, a lot of people are afraid of God, and it isn't always a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to understand, once again, in the original context, in the, the Hebrew background of the book of Revelation, you go to Psalms, you go to Proverbs, where the fear of God 
is a very, very common thing. It's the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, fear mm. of God is the beginning of wisdom. The, mm. the, the fear of God is to know Him. Mm. Uh, it is to do His commandments. It's to avoid evil. In other words, it seems to me the fear of God above all else is to take God seriously. Respect. Uh, to, to yeah. respect Him, yeah. to, to make Him the core of your life. Mm. Uh, a lot of people in today's world don't take God seriously. They, uh, they live as if God did not exist. Uh, they may believe in God, but the typical secular person uh, goes through life, uh, you know, God really isn't a part of my life, doesn't make a huge difference mm. in my life. Mm. So uh, the fear of God is a call. At the end of time, it would be especially needed that we take God extremely seriously. And I think that's what this is all about, that our lives uh, be accountable to God mm. uh, in a special way. The second element in uh, this text is to give Him glory. And of course, on the surface of that, uh, that would mean to praise Him, to worship Him, uh, and so forth. But there's a different element as well in this. To give God glory is not just something you do with your mouth but you can also give God glory with the kind of life you live. For example, uh, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do all to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So in the final proclamation of the gospel, there is a call to take very seriously uh, how we live our lives, mm -hmm. that everything we do, even such simple things as mm -hmm. eating and drinking, mm -hmm. Uh, we have God in mind as we do that. We attempt to tie everything we do to our faithfulness to Him. Uh, a, a person uh, might be even grocery shopping and say, I'm going to read a few labels here. I, I want to put into my body the things that will keep me healthy, to keep my mind clear so that I can uh, focus on the things that matter most. Mm -hmm. So giving God glory is more than just something you say with your mouth, but giving God glory has to do with everything that we do being connected and focused to God. The third element here is the element of judgment. The judgment has come. Uh, it's very, very clear. We've, we've talked about how in the course of the New Testament, judgment can be uh, related to a lot of different things. For example, uh, there's judgment at the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's judgment whenever the gospel is preached. We've talked about that frequently, how when you share the gospel, people decide one way or the other. They kind of divide, they split. Mm -hmm. uh, remember the, uh, the white horse and the red horse uh, mm -hmm. back in, in chapter six. Mm -hmm. So the preaching of the gospel is a judgment activity. But in the book of Revelation, whenever the words of judgment are used, it's not about the cross. It's not about the preaching of the gospel. Judgment is always an end time thing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting piece about this passage is as the final proclamation of the gospel is going forward, fear God, give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has already come. Mm -hmm. uh, many people believe that uh, the final judgment will occur at the second coming of Jesus. It's sort of the last thing that happens. Mm. But there's a real sense in which judgment occurs before the end. Sure. Judgment mm. is occurring while people are making decisions. Mm. So that, that whole process of mm. responding to the gospel is part of the end time judgment process. Sure. And finally, you had something you yeah, wanted to say. I, I yeah, I think this is important because when Jesus comes, He brings His reward with Him, doesn't He? Uh -huh. So decisions are made before He comes. Uh -huh. you know, okay. So there is a, what we call a pre-advent judgment, judgment uh -huh. going on before Jesus returns. And uh, you know, people have often seen three aspects of judgment. And the first aspect is what we call the pre-advent judgment. Uh, who gets rewards because Jesus brings his reward with him. And then there's a thousand years when the redeemed sit on thrones and judgment is given to them. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of recovery will take place during that time, John, because uh, people are going to see, you know, what has really been going on. Mm -hmm. Remember Paul said, we will even judge angels, which mm -hmm. is quite a powerful thing to say. And then it's the final part at the end of the thousand years when the all of humanity is alive at one time and there's a great resurrection, the number of whom is like the sand of the sea. They come before the throne of God and it says in Revelation 20, the books are open. That's the mm -hmm. final phase of the judgment. So everybody in heaven and earth eventually will say that God was fair and just. They get a chance to see the story. All right. Well, mm. Graham, that kind of 
went by a little bit like this. So I trust you're going to go a lot more deep on this in a later program, aren't you? Oh, for sure. Okay, good. Then, Just then introducing we'll be good. it. It's nice. It's nice to get the introduction, but I I, I want folk to know there's there's a lot more coming in that oh, yeah. regard. And this first yeah. angel's message is good news for the yeah. believer. Mm -hmm. The believer in Jesus, good news is the fact is that God is stepping in and doing something about the problem. All right. Yeah. Now we come to the center of the center of the center of that chiasm that the book is structured at eight times in chapters 13 and 14, worship is mentioned. Seven times that worship is directed to the dragon, to the beast, or uh, to the image of the beast. One time, only one time is there a call to worship God, to worship the Creator, and that is here at the end of verse 7. This is the central piece of this part of the book, probably the central call in the entire book of Revelation. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And as we have seen before, this is an illusion, a direct intentional uh, pointing to the fourth commandment of Exodus chapter 20. And here we see that at the final crisis of earth's history, in the final context of the gospel, God is calling all people to be accountable to Him, to be faithful to Him in every detail of their lives, even the way that they structure their lives. Mm -hmm. Graham, I remember perhaps some of the most beautiful things we've seen in Patmos. Mm. We couldn't resist, could we, no. having just one tour of Patmos. <laughs> yeah. We really had to have two. Yeah. So, Graham, Take us on that tour and reflect on this concept of worship. Okay, let's have a look. Many see Revelation as essentially a call to worship God as Creator. There are songs of praise uh, interspersed through all the scenes of calling our praise to God because He is the one who made the heavens, the earth, and He is our Creator. It's almost like as if the songs are God's cheer squad. Lord, you are right in what you're doing. You are the one who we are to worship and you and you alone. And so John on that lonely island of Patmos could see the nature, the beautiful harbour, the birds, the trees, and in his heart he could worship God just like you and I can worship God in our hearts too. And so towards the end of human history, just before it all winds up, God has a message to call people back to worship him as the creator the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. You know, John, the Sabbath was meant to be a beautiful thing, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a pity that a power, how could a person say it's a yoke of bondage? You know, mm -hmm. it's a matter of a love relationship with your Creator, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It was meant to be a time when families come together and, and go for a walk through the bush and do things together. The Sabbath was always meant to be a, a delight, an honourable thing where there's so much pressure in our world today, isn't there? Just so much pressure of getting things done, rushing to work, people are having breakdowns. You know, this is our modern society. We're supposed to have more time with all the gadgets and things we've got, but how often do we see a family has time to come together and just go for a stroll and walk and talk and get to know each other and uh, worship the Creator? We need more time like that, don't we? Hey, Graham, I, I think that fellow on that uh, video had a haircut a little bit like yours. I won't comment. <laughs> I'll give you the Australian politician favourite comment. No comment. <laughs> yeah, well, this brings the world to a test over the law of God. Mm -hmm. At the end of time, God has a message. And let's look at those tables again, because the commandments of God are mentioned so often in Revelation. We look at those commandments and we see, okay, the focus is not so much on the second, because that's always, that doesn't get us into trouble, does it? Honouring your father and mother is not going to get him into trouble when it comes to the crisis. The crisis regarding worship, the who, how and when you worship. And the focus on the Sabbath day commandment. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters is coming right out of that fourth commandment, John. Mm -hmm. So God himself mm -hmm. in very powerful language has given us this focus of an end time test. Not, this is not legalism. This is responding to Jesus. When the gospel goes out, you respond with loving obedience, of gratitude for what He's done for you, honouring God as Creator. So the first angel's message is a very positive message, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful invitation. But then we come to the second angel's message, which is a warning. And that's found in Revelation chapter 14 now and verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink 
the maddening wine of her adulteries. And so this is a warning. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. And Babylon stands for, you'd say, man's religion, an amalgamation of something very contrary to the gospel. It's mankind trying to work out their own way of doing things apart from the Creator. It really is rebellion. Mm -hmm. And the concept goes right way back to the Tower of Babel. We find that Babylon is used as an image of this in Scripture. But at the final time, an amalgamation of all false religion under the influence of demonic forces comes together and it's contrary to the gospel. So the first angel's message, a beautiful invitation to worship the Creator. The second angel's message, <coughs> a warning against the counterfeit. But coming up, we're going to look at the third angel's message, the consequences of making a wrong choice here. Welcome back. Uh, we've been talking about the three angels' messages, and in our previous segment, uh, Graham was emphasizing the point that uh, Sabbath is not a legalistic drudgery. Obviously, it can be made such, but that was not its intention on God's part. Instead, uh, the Sabbath was supposed to be something that was beneficial to the human race. Uh, a friend of mine, Richard Davidson, is a powerful scholar of the Old Testament. In fact, he recently published an 800-page book called Flame of Yahweh, a study of Old Testament sexuality. So he's a recognized scholar. Uh, he goes deep into these things. But I thought it would be neat if we could see such a scholar down to earth in the family. Would you be interested in that? Let's take a look. Well, I grew up in a Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping home. In fact, I'm a fourth-generation Sabbath keeper. And I have wonderful memories of childhood and uh, celebrating the Sabbath with my family. I remember the times um, as the Sabbath would begin on Friday at sunset, we would sit out on the lawn swing in the backyard and we would sing, Day is Dying in the West. And my brother had made a homemade telescope. We'd look at Jupiter and Mars through the telescope. And my mom had this special blue glass bowl that she would put in my favorite food, fresh fruit salad. And I was always look forward to that every Friday night. And then on Sabbath, we would have wonderful activities at church. And in the afternoon, we'd go hiking up in the mountains. Uh, my favorite place was Fish Canyon, the falls, glorious falls there in Southern California. And uh, the whole Sabbath was just, was just great. Uh, Sabbath was the most delightful day of all the week for me as a child. And I have to say, it still is. For me, the essence of the, of the Sabbath is found in Isaiah 58 and verse 13, where God says, call the Sabbath a delight. And the Hebrew word here for delight is oneg, which is a special word for delight. There's over a dozen words for joy and delight in Hebrew, but this one means exquisite royal delight. For us, as the Davidson family, Sabbath is a day of joy and celebration, a day indeed of exquisite delight. Mm -hmm. I think that's very attractive, isn't it? Yeah. It was meant mm -hmm. to be like that, sure. Mm -hmm. So the first angel's message is a beautiful invitation mm -hmm. to accept the gospel and respond with a worship of the Creator. And the second angel's message is a warning of the, of the counterfeit, you might say, of institutionalized religion. Mm -hmm. And the third angel's message really is a prophecy. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14 now, and we'll see here in Revelation 14 of the warning, which is a prophecy of the consequences if the first message is not received. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or anyone who receives the mark of his name. Wow! <laughs> I don't think you'll find any language anywhere in Scripture more powerful than this. 
Uh, God certainly is stirred over whatever this is, God is taking it serious, which means we better take it serious too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it is interesting to notice how the expressions are used here of torment forever and ever. And as John has so often said, so much of the expressions of Revelation have an Old Testament origin. Mm -hmm. And this expression we're looking at now goes right back to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to read how this wording and expression is found in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, and Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8, commencing in verse 8, For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution, to uphold Zion's cause. Eden's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur. Her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched night and day. Its smoke will rise forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate and no one will ever pass through it again. This is obviously att attached to culture. It's an expression of speech which every culture has. When people come to Australia, we often say, she'll be right, mate. <laughs> and people will say, well, who is she? E every culture has expressions. And this term forever can be used in a far more limited you know, way. I mean, no one will pass through it forever. Uh, this is talking about the land of Edom, which we would say today is Jordan, where Petra is found. And I've been there, so have you, so mm -hmm. have you. That's right. And I didn't mm -hmm. see any flames. <laughs> no, you can pass right through it just fine. Uh, it's a pretty desolate place, so some very interesting archaeological sites. And, and yet the yeah. text says no one will pass through it forever. Uh -huh. That's literally what it means. And uh, So forever in this case doesn't mean what we mean by forever in English. That's correct. Uh -huh. And we find that if you just take a concordance and look up the word, in uh, how it's used in Scripture, you'll find it's used in a far more limited sense than we use today. And uh, also we find the book of Jude, verse 7, how Sodom and Gomorrah will be destroyed with eternal fire. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been around the Dead Sea area where Sodom is supposed to exist somewhere, and I'm sure you have too, but there is no fire burning. So we're dealing here with a cultural expression, which we take today and use it as we understand it, but if you're going to let the Bible interpret itself, which we should do, see how the other Bible writers use the word and it'll put us on the right track. Mm -hmm. So we have here this concept of destruction, but it is serious, a serious matter. Mm -hmm. God is t saying, okay, if here are the consequences if you receive the mark of the beast, and we cannot water that down. It mm -hmm. is serious, and it happens in the very presence of the Lamb. And so this is something that we, we need to, you know, we cannot run away from and ignore. But the issue is coming to a, a, a harvest, you might say. The, these three messages produce a harvest. And uh, the last part of the chapter 14 talk about these two harvests. The first one is a grain harvest. So those who are accepting the message and respond to the gospel as it's preached are likened to a grain harvest that Jesus reaps when he returns back to this world again. Those who reject it and receive the mark of the beast are likened to another harvest, which is likened to a wine harvest or a grape harvest where it's crushed and destroyed, you might say. And so this is telling us quite clearly, this is God's last warning message to the world. After this, there is nothing else. You make a decision. The preaching of these messages will produce two harvests. It calls the world, like Elijah called the world in, of his day in Israel, how long halt, you, do you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, serve him. Otherwise, serve Baal. This message has this type of effect. Two harvests. People have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's one more point, I think, in Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Uh, in many ways, uh, uh, this is somewhat of a disturbing passage, particularly because I, I think some people have the idea uh, that uh, violence in the Bible is primarily in the Old Testament, and that with Jesus uh, we come to a, a different expression of grace and kindness and gentleness and so forth. Here you have a picture of Jesus, the Lamb, and uh, the Lamb is overseeing this torment. Mm. It talks about fury and anger. In fact, in chapter 6, verse 17, you even have the wrath of the lamb. Yeah. Now, if anyone has ever seen a lamb, what kind of image is that? 
a raging lamb. Can you imagine that? A lamb that's really <laughs> upset. You know, you see? Yeah. And uh, this whole concept of wrath of God and so on, uh, we're going to have a, a, a scholar come on in our next program to talk a bit, little bit more about the wrath of God. And I think that will be helpful to us. But one thing that I would mention here is this wrath is not losing it emotionally. Mm -hmm. I think when we hear the word wrath, fury, anger, uh, you, you think of the way people do anger. People mm. get out of control. Mm. They throw things. Mm. They break things. Mm. They hurt people. Mm. They hurt children. Mm. You see? And to apply this image to God can be a very, very disturbing thing. So a lot of people, some of my uh, best scholarly friends, very disturbed by some of the things that happen here in Revelation, particularly uh, in these verses here and the rest of the chapter. A point, I think, that needs to be made is that this wrath in the Hebrew concept, in the Old Testament concept, which is the root of what John, that was his Bible, okay? Uh, this wrath is not somebody emotionally losing it. God is not going nuts, as some people would say, but rather the wrath of God is more of a judicial thing. Mm -hmm. It's an act of judgment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, you could almost say, I remember one time I was driving along in the state of New Jersey and a policeman came along and stopped me. And uh, that wasn't fun, but he gave me a ticket. And on that ticket, it said, the people of New Jersey against John Pauline. <laughs> that felt terrible. What hope have you got? You see, I think the whole state of New Jersey is <laughs> against there. me. You know, what, what chance do I have? This is a terrible thing. That, I think, comes closer to the idea of wrath of God here uh, than does, you know, the idea of kind of going crazy. It's simply what I had done had in some way undermined the order of the state of New Jersey and needed to be set right. Uh -huh. And therefore, certain actions would be taken. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, severe stuff, uh, difficult challenges. Uh, when uh, we take a little break, uh, we're gonna come back and we're gonna join Pamela and we're gonna see what she thinks about some of these texts. back. Uh, Graham and I have joined Pamela and she's smiling as usual, but uh, I think reading Revelation 14, 9 to 11 uh, had a bit of a disturbing effect, didn't it? Yeah, a bit. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, uh, could this be the same, uh, you know, God that Jesus revealed? I mean, the, the language is so threatening and severe. Mm -hmm. um, is this the same God? I mean, it's just... Maybe we're seeing that God takes this one pretty serious. And uh, this is a tough question, Pamela. It really is. I, and I won't try to hide from the fact that it is, this is tough. Mm -hmm. And we, we look at it, probably our culture relates to these things differently to the Bible culture. Uh, that could be part of it as well. Mm -hmm. But remember, this is not a punishment upon a person who has sinned like Mary Magdalene, who, you know, who, you know genuinely was repentant. Mm -hmm. These people have had opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel go to the world. These people have seen the work of God in action and have chosen a different direction mm. and have turned upon God's people who tried to be faithful to him. They've received a warning, warning, warning that this was coming up. And uh, so I don't know if I've got the full answer to this, except culture could be part of it. But I do know that God's love is over the whole of his creation. He's not willing that any should repentance. And the language used here should surely tell us that this is a serious matter. To mm. worship the creator and how we worship him we cannot water it down. God takes yeah. it seriously, and so should we. What do you think, John? I'd, I'd like to underline something you said. I think the people who are most disturbed about this passage are often the tender-hearted ones, uh, people who have suffered, people who have been abused, and so forth. And, and they feel like now God's going to be the big abuser as well. 
No, I, th I think the severity of the language here is actually a call out to the abuser, to the oppressor, the one who thinks they're great, uh, that their place in the world is the way everything should be. Mm. And, and they're the ones that don't listen. Mm. And the severity of the language is kind of a call to, hey, come on, guys, you know, get with the program. Uh, this is not, you know, I, I think is a tendency for those for whom the passage was not spoken to take it personally. Mm. And uh, in reality, uh, this passage is for those who have been rebellious, uh, for those who have been abusive and oppressive. Those are the ones who are the target of this passage. Mm. But uh, coming back to the policemen there uh, in the state of New it's Jersey on your mind, isn't it? and so forth, <laughs> uh, I have a friend who's very astute in these matters, and, and, and he says when you really boil it down, the one function of government is the just exercise of violence. And you say, what do you mean? Governments are supposed to be violent? Well, society needs to stay in order. And there are always some people who break out of that order, who create problems, and who need to be restrained. Mm -hmm. You say, well, was that violence when the policeman stopped me? In a sense, it was. Did I want to stop? No. Mm -hmm. But if I had not stopped, if I had kept on driving, as people do in Los Angeles every so often, all the TV helicopters come in because they want to see, you know, is this person going to get killed at the end or it'll be a big accident, a flaming pileup, you see. Uh, if I don't stop, something worse is going to happen to me, mm. you see. So the government, the role of government is to restrain evil, to restrain uh, societies breaking down and, and to provide uh, some control there. Here's the point with the end of the world. The greater the evil, the greater the violence necessary to overthrow it. Evil doesn't back down voluntarily. The policeman light comes, evil doesn't say, oh, I'll just stop and be nice. No, evil uh, wants its way regardless of the good of others. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitler was not defeated by Chamberlain with his nice words and his peaceful thoughts. Mm. He was defeated by six years of some of the greatest violence in Earth's history. At the end of time, the greatest evil in all history will be confronted. And so the images naturally show God putting an end to evil, restraining evil, sometimes in the only language that evil understands. We'll take a break at this point. We'll return uh, at the main table. And we want to summarize the center of the center of Revelation, particularly chapters 12, 13, and 14, when we return. Welcome back. In this concluding segment, I'd like to balance out just a little bit uh, some of the emphases we've been seeing, particularly in Revelation 13, uh, where we saw that the negative side of the final conflict of Earth's history is the center of focus. Here we see the more positive side, and as you work all the way through chapters 10 through 14, you get different glimpses of the end time people of God. Sometimes the image is uh, two witnesses, sometimes it's a holy city, sometimes it's remnant, sometimes it's 144,000, sometimes it's the saints. There are many different terms that are used for the people of God at the end of time. The big question that comes before us and why I'd like to summarize at this point, how would you recognize God's end time people? Where would they be? When would they be? Uh, how would you locate them? So there's a couple of things I'd like to share. First of all, the marks of the remnant, let's call them, picking up the term that's the, the core term for chapters 12, 13, and 14. First of all, the remnant, the end time remnant comes at the close of Daniel's time prophecies. Uh, we haven't in this uh, series of seminars uh, gone deeply enough into that to work that all through, uh, but Graham and I believe that we are living in that time uh, at the close of Daniel's time prophecies between that time and the end. So we're in the period of time when this remnant uh, should appear. 
they will have a prophetic gift. Once again, uh, we haven't had the time to work that through in detail, uh, but if we had the time, we would certainly continue with that and show that uh, the end time remnant people uh, will have a gift like the gift that John had. This is a point that is made in chapter 12, 17, comparing with a number of other texts uh, within the book of Revelation. A third mark of the end time remnant is that they reflect the character of Jesus. So you're going to look for some people who will act like Jesus does. And as, as we said, that doesn't always mean just being sweet and, and, uh, and kind and humble because love also confronts. Jesus confronts His people. I stand at the door and knock. You know, see, and if anyone opens the door, I'll come in. He, he confronts. He, he comes to people and He says, uh, our relationship is being threatened. A relationship that never confronts isn't a real love relationship and it'll eventually collapse. So God seeking a relationship with us does a lot of confronting in the book of Revelation, but that's part of the character of God, the character of Jesus that is calling us back to relationship with Him. A fourth mark of the remnant is preaching the three angels' messages. And this is one reason why this series of programs has been done, because we believe that the book of Revelation, climaxing the Bible, is calling on the people of God to emphasize these themes at this very time in history. A fifth mark of the remnant is that it would have worldwide impact. We believe that there will be a time when the entire world will have a focus on the kinds of issues uh, that you see here in the book of Revelation. Another a mark of the remnant is worldwide relevance. In other words, these issues may not seem relevant in today's world, but the day will come when they will be central, when the issue of worship to God will take two radically different forms, uh, when people will be called to make a decision, called to, uh, to think these things through. And finally, it makes it clear that the message will be opposed. When the final gospel message goes to the world, it isn't going to be everybody saying, oh my, isn't this wonderful, we really need to get on board. But in actual fact, the final proclamation of the gospel will uh, be tremendously controversial. What then would be the message of this end time remnant? What should we be looking for in that message? There's a number of features. I actually have eight. Let me go over them one at a time briefly. First of all, the gospel. We found that in chapter 10 and also in chapter 14. Uh, it will be a message about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. It will be the same old eternal gospel message that has been taught uh, by so many of God's people <coughs> from the time of Jesus until today. But there will be a second feature. This message will be in the context of Daniel and Revelation. The gospel needs to be combined with a prophetic end-time end time emphasis. When those two come together, it will have a unique power at the end of time. A third aspect is the heavenly sanctuary. This is so central to the book of Revelation. And in the final context, of these sanctuary messages that may seem so strange at this time uh, may uh, have a very powerful impact on our lives. A fourth element of the message of the remnant is obedience to the commandments of God. And obviously, um, I think so many governments, uh, so many religions uh, center their lives around the commandments of God. Obviously, if this is going to be an issue, there must be specific commandments in mind. And the focus in the book of Revelation is not on the second table of the commandments, not on how we relate to each other, but the focus of Revelation is on the first side of the commandments, commandments related to God. And of course, the most controversial of those would be the Sabbath command. A fifth element of the remnant's message is to warn the world of deception, that not everything that calls on the name of Christ is truly the way of God. A sixth element in the remnant's message is to focus on relationship with Jesus. And this we saw in chapter 14. Also in chapter 14, of course, is a call that the final judgment has come and not only that, it is a call to remember in particular the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day. This is a package of the messages of the remnant, uh, including these eight features. We want to 
find that message. We want to put that together as a package. This is what I understand, Revelation 10 through 14, particularly the apex of the chiasm is focusing on, the kind of people, the kind of message they will give at the end of time. Mm -hmm. John, you know, that's quite a package, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is a package. And I want to encourage our watchers of this program to, to have, begin a search, to look at yourself, you may worship in a community, uh, you may not worship in a community, but if you are worshiping in, in some religious community, have a look. Now, is that community meeting these characteristics? Um, you know, these, these are important things that the Bible has pointed out. Now, if you find a worshiping community that is doing that, then they'll be certainly very conscious that they're doing this, mm -hmm. that they've been called to bring a message to the world. Uh, but don't expect those people to be a large popular majority. Mm -hmm. It's not usually been that way in history. Uh, whenever God has a message, it, it isn't always borne by, a, I can't think of any when, any time it's ever been borne by a large popular majority, really. Mm -hmm. It's usually a smaller group of people going against the current trends of society or religious you know, entities and um, often misunderstood, often misrepresented, but they stay where they are doing what they're doing because they believe that they're called of God. And I often say to folk, you know, if you live, live back in the days of Noah, would you have got inside the ark? <laughs> you know, folk would say, oh, of course, you know. Yeah, but would you? Would you have got inside? Only Noah and his family really believe what Noah was preaching. When Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and called people to make a decision, where was the popular majority? Where were the great religious leaders at the time? Mm -hmm. Elijah stood alone with God. Mm -hmm. It would have taken a lot of faith to believe that Elijah had a message from God. Mm -hmm. It would have, wouldn't it? Yeah. When Jesus came preaching and teaching, would you have accepted him as the Messiah? I know we all say, oh, of course he fulfilled the prophecies. Yeah, that, that's being wise in hindsight. But would you, when so many turned away from Jesus and rejected him, and when he died on Calvary, he looked like he was a beaten man, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Till later on the resurrection and Christianity grew. Would we have followed him at that moment? Would we have followed him yeah. at that moment? So if God has a message to be preached, don't expect it to be a large popular movement It'll be borne by people who are very conscious that God has called them to preach that message. And I want to challenge you to begin a search. Begin a search to find a community, a religious community, a Christian group who are preaching this message at this time in history. Well, thank you for watching our program. And coming up next, we're going to see in our next program the consequences coming out of the rejection of the Three Angels' messages. It's very serious indeed. We look forward to meeting with you again. If you've enjoyed this presentation on the Book of Revelation and would like more information, visit www.revelationhope.com. You can purchase your own DVD set of this series or the booklets which cover the content of each program. 